Today's host is Senior Editor Chris Sheridan. Joining us on the show today is Peter Zion. He's a geopolitical strategist, best-selling author, and he helps people figure out what is in store for them when we think about how all of these interesting events are coming together. So, Peter, you have written a number of best-selling books, and I want to give a full endorsement first for your prior books. For any of you listeners out there that have not read any of Peter Zion's work, or his prior books. The first one was The Accidental Superpower, The Next Generation of American Preeminence and The Coming Global Disorder, Absolute Must Read. We spoke with you about that book around the time after it came out. And then the second one is The Absent Superpower, The Shale Revolution and a World Without America. I know we're going to be touching upon some of those works, but you now have a new book out called Disunited Nations, The Scramble for Power in an Ungoverned World. I know it is available for pre-order currently and will be released March 3rd, 2020. So you can definitely pre-order that. But the first question I have for you is, where does your latest book, Disunited Nations, fit into the context of your first two? Sure. Well, Accidental is about how the world came to be in the shape that it is. Why the Americans created the post World War II order in the way that they did, why they did it, and how it has, for lack of a better phrase, uh, fallen out of favor. Uh, the United States is moving on. We're no longer interested in patrolling the world. We didn't necessarily do that out of the goodness of our hearts. We just didn't want to fight the Soviets directly. So we bribed everyone to be on our side. And so Accidental is about the possibilities of the future, what the United States could and would do and the international crises that would boil up around the rest of the world that the Americans would either out of familiarity or, I mean, right there in their face, uh, be most likely to pay attention to. Absent picks up with the shale revolution and plays it forward, shows how it remakes the American industrial experience and the wars that all erupt around the world as a result of the American absence. And what we do with disunited nations is we take a closer look at the players all of those countries that we're all convinced that are going to be the next tier of major powers, Russia and China and Brazil and Germany, and we throw a whole lot of cold water on those arguments. And instead, we discuss the countries that actually will rise up to displace the United States within their own neighborhoods. And those countries are a very different list. That is France. That is Argentina. That is Turkey. That is Japan. These are the real powers of the future. Now, I want to build on the second book, The Absent Superpower, because you talked about the shale revolution. That was something that you definitely touched on with us when we spoke with you previously as well. This is a, a pretty big topic right now. A lot of people talking about how it looks like the shale revolution is peaking out. And I know that you discuss quite a bit of how this impacted America's geopolitical relationship with the rest of the world. Is this something that you get into on Disunited Nations, or what are your thoughts on how we're set up geopolitically-wise now because of Shell? Uh, well, let's go back to absent a little bit. The Shell revolution has come in phases. So phase one was breaking, cracking the code of oil, figuring out how to get the stuff out of ground in the first place. In that first phase, the Shale operators really needed a very favorable price environment something over $75 a barrel, preferably something over 90 And when the supply of crude globally was constrained, and when geopolitical tensions pushed up prices, this was kind of the perfect operating environment, and we had that from roughly 2005 until 2015. And so in that decade, shale produced a lot more crude, but more importantly, became a lot better at producing the crude. And by the time we got to 2015, the break-even price for shale was probably about $60 to $65 a barrel. Certainly not cost competitive with countries like um, Russia or Saudi Arabia, but actually doing very, very well compared to, say, the North Sea or Canada. Well, what's happened since 2015 is that oil prices in dribs and drafts have uh, come down, and the shale operators have had to get better and better and better at what they do. So it used to be that they could throw money at any possible technology, and even if it didn't work very well, they could still hone it a little bit. More lately, with the price pressures, they've had to force those technologies to either get on board and become fully operationalized or kind of be relegated to the back. And we've seen oil prices drop below that $65 point. Well, now the break-even price throughout the shale fields is probably a little under $40 a barrel. And so when folks say that shale is peaking out, it isn't that it's become cost competitive or cost uncompetitive. 
And it isn't that it's vanishing or by any stretch of the imagination. What's happening is the United States has saturated its own market. Uh, we're now net exporters. And we're in the point of being dependent in the shales patch for demand beyond the United States. And that introduces just another layer of complexity. But at the same time, these changes in technology, these improvements in efficiency, they keep getting better and better. So within a year, certainly within two, the break-even price in the U.S. shale patch is going to be below $25 a barrel, and that is cheaper than Saudi Arabia. So it's not that shale has peaked. It's that shale has succeeded. And when you're at the top of the heap, it's just not all that exciting to talk about it again. In terms of power options for the United States, they broadly fall into two general categories. The first is strategic. If the United States is a net exporter and the few strains of crude that it still imports are coming from the Western Hemisphere, then really what goes on in the Eastern Hemisphere is not of major interest to the United States from an economic point of view. We've never been a trading country. The whole idea of the global order is we pay you to be on our side by keeping our market open and allowing you to trade with the wider world and allowing a global oil market to exist. Uh, but if the United States no longer has a strategic interest in fighting the Cold War, which ended 30 years ago, and hasn't figured out what it needs a, the alliance system for in the present, then all of those outlays that kept the entire Eastern Hemisphere functioning no longer are relevant to American decision makers. And we've seen the slow progression of that under the last four presidents now, culminating in President Trump, who just wants to walk away from the whole thing. So if you're in the Eastern Hemisphere and you want reasonably priced, freely available oil or computers or telephones or iron ore or solar panels, you're kind of on your own now. And the world is only in the beginning phases of kind of coming to terms with that. The second piece of this is purely economic. With U.S. shale now cheaper than not just the global average, but edging down towards being cheaper than even the cheapest of the Middle Eastern crude, we are seeing industry in the United States adapt to that new reality. If you're in construction, it means your diesel fuel is cheaper. If you're in agriculture, it means your fertilizer is cheaper. If you're in petrochemicals, it means that you're taking some of these excess outputs from the shale revolution and becoming the lowest cost, highest quality, highest volume producers in the world. And the United States is becoming a new nexus of economic activity on a scale that we really haven't seen since the pioneer era. It is going to take us 20 years to upgrade our infrastructure and economic systems to fully integrate this shale output into what we do, but it is already generating the fastest industrial build-out that we have seen since World War II. Play that against what's going on in the wider world. If you've got low-cost, high-quality energy here and lower-cost, higher-quality production of other things here, and you have higher cost, more geopolitically vulnerable production in the wider world, it does not take a big leap of logic to see the United States segueing from being the guarantor of global security to a cause of global insecurity. Because if you can disrupt trade patterns globally and it has no effect at home, the price differential alone will generate an economic boom. And this is a sort of a Activity we're used to seeing out of places like Russia or Iran, where they threaten global stability in order to perk up oil prices at home, all of a sudden the United States can play that card. And we can do it with supercarriers. As you were pointing out towards the beginning of this interview, in Accidental Superpower, you talked about how the post-World War II global order was largely oriented around America providing that security for all of the global trade and goods and that has been in place for you know ever since we look back 50 plus years 70 years and now we're seeing a transition away from that and that's what leads us from your first book to your third book it sounds like with this power vacuum now and energy is a key part of understanding this shift i'd say the, the biggest thing that it's going to be difficult for folks to understand is what's happened really not just in the last 70 years but the last 30. When we created the global order, we basically paid everyone to be our side. We provided global security so there could be global trade. There never really had been before. Either you were part of an imperial network or you weren't. That lasted until the end of the Cold War. And with the end of the Cold War, the Americans kind of threw open membership in the system to anyone who was interested. And that included everything from the defeated communist world to the non-aligned world. 
And so countries as wildly various as Brazil and South Africa and Russia itself were all of a sudden able to join this network and tap global trade for the first time. And the same thing happened from 1990 to 2015 that happened from 1940 to 1980. Countries that had never experienced peace had peace. Net countries that had never experienced large-scale trade experienced large-scale trade. And countries that had never been able to generate their own economic growth could be part of a global system that almost guaranteed it. Everyone could access raw materials. Everyone could access energy. Everyone could access end markets. And the growth was explosive. And what most people in finance and manufacturing and agriculture and everything else today miss is that this boom since 1990 is the most artificial economic activity in human history. And it is completely dependent upon ongoing American strategic largesse, largesse that is now evaporating. So the big topic in disunited nations is what happens to individual countries as the world changes, as the rules change, as we go back to something that was a lot more normal before the year 1900 than what we've seen since World War II. And for a short list of countries, this is great. Because if you've got a perfect geography and a local demand base and you can supply your own food and energy, this is the sort of environment in which you shine. But that is not the case for most of the world. Most of the world internationalized starting in 1945 and then really doubled down on it in 1992. But that isn't going to last. And so for the more integrated a country is, the more in danger they are, especially if they don't have the military capacity to protect their own supply lines. And for most countries, that's exactly the problem. There's really only two that have a chance of doing it. Now, on our podcast, we talk a bit about demographics and long-term economic trends and how this relates on a macro or fundamental perspective for how you should be allocating capital towards different countries. It would sound like your latest book, Disunited Nations, The Scramble for Power in an Ungovernable World, is going to obviously provide another element, another backing of, hey, let's look at these long-term economic trends and show how they would either benefit you or not based on where you're thinking about investing in various countries or various foreign assets. Would you agree with that? It sounds like well, it's, it's, that's a pretty strong endorsement it's, for investors. <laughs> it's not a finance book, but it will certainly give you an idea of the sort of countries that will rise and fall and why uh, and what sort of economic sectors might be a little bit more interesting uh, based on where you're looking. Most countries don't have what they need domestically to be successful. Most countries, historically speaking, have only lasted for a generation or two. Uh, they've been founded by a little climactic blip or maybe a good leadership or an empire looking the other direction for a while. And these places have kind of formed their local continuities and thrived briefly because then the climate shifts back or the leadership dies or the emperor turns and looks in your general direction and decides to come and take your stuff. It's very rare for a country to last more than a century unless it was an empire. And even those empires rise and fall. So one of the big things I drive home in disunited nations is, you know, what are the building blocks that you need to be a successful country historically and in the modern age? A big piece of it is demographics, as you noted. If you don't have a lot of young people, if you're not having a lot of children, you're going to be a flash in the pan, historically speaking. And countries as diversified today as China and Germany fall into that category, and they will not be existing in what we recognize as unified nation states within 20 years. They just don't have the population. Uh, another piece is, can you grow your own food or at least get it from somebody close by? Uh, there aren't a lot of countries that can support the populations they have today. One of the big outcomes of the global order was we allowed anyone to export anything and then import anything. And so countries could export iron ore and import rice or export electronics and import pork. But if you break down global trade, the price of food goes up as its availability goes down. And for countries that are heavily dependent on food imports, places as diversified as Nigeria and Venezuela, all of a sudden the very building blocks of your society go away. Uh, third is energy. Uh, whether you consider it solar or wind or oil or coal, either you have it or you don't. About 90% of the Earth's service is actually not good for green generation. It's either not windy enough, it's not sunny enough, it's at too high of an elevation so the wind turbines don't blow, it has too much haze so solar power doesn't work. 
And then, of course, we're all very familiar with how oil is really concentrated in only a few regions. Uh, so for about two-thirds of humanity, energy is going to be a constant crisis issue. Because without global trade, you can't get the stuff from where it's produced to where it is consumed. And again, there's only a handful of countries that do well in that sort of scenario. And you add all of this up, and you really only get five countries on the planet that are relatively self-sufficient or can at least look after their own needs. And they're just not the countries that we're used to hearing about. Now, whether or not that means you want to go out and invest in those countries is an entirely separate question, because just because you can have stability and economic growth and industrialization doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a financial sector that is amenable to outside participation. Probably the key examples here are Turkey and Argentina, two countries that really haven't made in the new era, but I would not recommend for a heartbeat going and buying property in the countries like this that have absolutely no respect for foreign ownership. Now, so you mentioned that there are really only five countries that are relatively self-sufficient when we think about this global breakdown of, of order that's existed since post-World War II. Breakdown of globalization itself is what it sounds like you're talking about. And this is going to benefit some countries and others are going to be hurt by it massively. The current countries that we think of at the top of the list when we look at their GDP and how they participate in this global order, they're going to be shuffled pretty massively. I want to get your thoughts on some of those countries, but let's start with the U.S., the biggest and most important from a global GDP standpoint. Would a global breakdown and some of the things that you're talking about, wouldn't it negatively affect the U.S.? If not, why? Well, that really depends upon your politics. If you're like me and you think that the future of the United States is to lead a coalition of like-minded countries to make the world a better place, yeah, it's kind of a disaster. But people who believe my way have now lost seven presidential elections in a row. And honestly, we're not relevant anymore. The American people have chosen a very different path under the last four presidents of increasing isolation. And this is just because I don't like it doesn't mean it can't work. So the United States is the least involved economy in the world in terms of international trade. We, we have not been a trading country in over a century, which means that we can sever our connections to the wider world should we so choose and not suffer all that much. In addition, about half of what trade exposure we do have is within North America. So we can have a local security and trade network within the NAFTA system and not have to really worry over much about the rest of the world. You add in the fact that the United States is the world's largest agricultural exporter and the world's largest energy producer, and there's really nothing that the United States needs from the wider world that's a large scale or a security issue or determinant in its technological advance. Toss in the world's largest supercarrier force, which I must underline is larger than everyone else's combined, and the U.S. doesn't face a naval threat either. So the U.S. can reach out and touch anyone that it wants to at any time, but the United States is basically untouchable. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have issues. That doesn't mean we're not going to have some lively debates about this or that issue. But it does mean that the United States has the opportunity, the freedom, the narcissistic capacity to wallow in its own juices and really not worry about the rest of the world. It's not a very flattering future for the United States in terms of what we've achieved in the last 200 years, but that seems to be where the American electorate wants to be right now, and it can work. So it sounds like the U.S. would be at the top of the list in terms of those countries that are self-sufficient, given what you just said. By far, yes. Yeah, large oil reserves, agriculture, unparalleled Navy, naval power, a confluence of geographic virtues. And you discussed a lot of that, again, in Accidental Superpower, your first book. So if, if any of you have not read that and are not familiar with some of these arguments, I would highly recommend that. What about the second biggest country and one that gets a lot of attention? People thinking that eventually China will overtake the U.S. Where does China fit into this list? Yeah, China is not going to be a unified country 10 years from now. The short version is that everything that has made China successful – Financial and technological import, uh, industrial expansion, energy markets, end users around the world, everything, absolutely everything has been made possible by the United States. If you remove the Americans from patrolling the seas and all of a sudden the seas are no longer safe in commerce, the cost of commerce goes up and the volume of commerce goes down, China is arguably one of the top three countries that is going to suffer. And there is no iteration of China throughout its long history when it has ever 
ever been both united and wealthy without being occupied. And we're just going back to the historical norm here. So the very survival of the Chinese state is no longer guaranteed, and I don't see their system holding. Uh, Their energy system, they are now importing more crude than the United States ever did, even at the height of our dependence. They're more dependent upon industrial exports than the United States has ever been, arguably more dependent than almost any other country in East Asia, with the exception maybe of South Korea. They are close to food self-sufficiency, but only because they import all of the commodities that are necessary to drive their agricultural sector. And I'm not talking tractors here. I'm talking the things that you use to make fertilizer. And if you reduce those shipments, make them more complicated, there is no way that China can support a population of 1.2 billion people. And when you don't have enough food to feed everybody, you start choosing who you can feed. And every time that that has happened in China, you get a civil war. You've also pointed out that they are now the most overcredited country in human history in absolute and relative terms. <laughs> yes. Do you mind elaborating on that a little bit? Sure. The, the Chinese system doesn't work like the American or even the European system. Here, capital is considered a financial and a economic good, and it has to be husbanded and used, and efficiency matters. And when you take a loan, you have to pay it back, all that good stuff. That's absolutely not how it works in China. In China, money is a political good. It is seen as an asset to be used by the state to achieve specific goals, which means things like efficiency are not a big deal. Workforce employment is a big deal. Throughput is a big deal. Volume is a big deal. Basically, what they do is they subsidize the cost of capital so they can fund bottomless development projects and bottomless industrial expansion. doesn't matter if there's an end user on the other side. One of the reasons we saw steel mills and cement factories going bankrupt around the world is the Chinese would buy raw materials, build them into intermediate goods like steel, like cement, and then dump them on the international market because they ran out of demand at home. One of the big things with One Belt, One Road is that they have now supersaturated the global market with this excess output. And so they now have to put it in some places that folks would never build things. I mean, what was the the first railroad destination for One Belt, One Road went to what? Northern Afghanistan? I'm sorry, but what does the winner get out of that? Uh, So they're building all of this infrastructure that's completely economically unviable to places that even under the height of global stability in the order are still not economically viable. This is not what I would call a winning plan. Uh, You add in things like the one-child policy. 30 years after the one-child policy, the Chinese have run out of 30-year-olds. They're not nearly as good at math as they'd have us all believe. Consider what's going on with the agricultural system. This financial model is most heavily applied to agriculture, which means when they finally have a crack in their financial system, they don't just face a subprime-style crisis in every single sector that they have. They face food shortages. They face famine. They have set themselves up for an absolute, unprecedented civilizational collapse. All this hype is just that. We are at the height of the China bubble. My biggest fear with this new book is that China will crack before the book comes out, but that's a risk I'm willing to take. That is a very, very bold statement. And yeah, I mean, some of the things that you've pointed to, not just their demographics, their financial system, there's a lot of troubling and disturbing things there for sure. And I think it's going to be very interesting to read a lot of those things that you have in your new book. Yeah, a couple of things when, when you're thinking about financial investments, if you're looking at some places like China, when you're dealing with an environment of bottomless supply of capital, you can get some very impressive buildups in stock value. But because none of it generates any sort of productive capacity that is actually economically viable, it is only being popped up by that financial largesse. Between the end of the gold order, between the end of the boomer bulge here in the United States, which is going to contract large-scale capital supplies, between the one-child policy in China, you are quite literally gambling if you're investing for the Chinese stock exchanges. Uh, because everything that allows this to work is artificial and is not built on bu- and economic fundamentals. And so when this does go, it's all going to go. Speaking of financial markets, where do the currency markets fit into disunited nations and the scramble for power? 
Well, there is no European Union without the global order. Uh, the, the Europeans had uh, terminal growth patterns in their demography starting about 40 years ago. 40 years later, they have run out of 40-year-olds in most places, uh, which means that they are now completely dependent upon exports in order to maintain their standard of living and their financial wherewithal. You remove the United States from that equation, there's nothing about the European Union that can last, and that includes the euro. So if you've got a Chinese crisis, a European slouch slash breakdown, the Japanese not wanting to play that game, the next currency down is the pound. And if there's anything that Brexit has taught us is that the Brits should never be in charge of anything ever again. The only other hard currencies in the world are the Swedish krona, the Danish krona, and uh, the Canadian dollar, the Aussie dollar, and the Kiwi dollar. That's everything. That's all of them. So if you've got the United States having economic dynamism, if the United States has, even with its aging baby movers, a relatively stable demography, and most of the world is going through some sort of convulsion, there is no place to go except the U.S. dollar, the Canadian dollar, the Aussie dollar, and the Kiwi dollar. And obviously, the United States will absorb more of that capital flight than everything else put together tripled, which means the U.S. dollar really has nowhere to go but up for the rest of our lives. Doesn't mean it'll be a straight line. There will always be the blip of the moment, the economic boomer recession of the moment, but it will be getting stronger decade on decade for quite some time. Where has America inserted itself into the currency markets? And there's particularly what I'm trying to get at is a comment that you'd made in a recent presentation talking about exercising more control. The hegemony that exists with the US dollar as a global reserve currency, I understand from what you've said, is that they've exercised, the U.S. has exercised even more power by inserting itself into almost every single trade and currency transaction. Do you mind building on that a little bit? Sure. I wouldn't say the United States has inserted itself with what you're referencing there. It's just more of a, a dynamic of how it has to be. If you have the same product being sold in two different markets, and there's nothing to differentiate it. So I'm not talking here like computers or handbags. I'm, I'm talking here about things like natural gas or, or coal or grain, uh, if you have two different global currencies that will price the exact same thing differently, uh, you will have an immense amount of chaos in financial markets and trading markets because the same thing can't be worth a different amount in the same market if it's in two different currencies. It just doesn't work that way. It would, be, it would just be a complete breakdown. Uh, the, the amount of arbitrage that you'd have within a neighborhood would be ridiculous. So you can really only have one global currency ever. You'd have multiple hard currencies. You can really only have one global currency. And that takes us a couple of places. It means that in all trade that doesn't directly access the U.S. dollar, you still have to use the U.S. dollar as an intermediary. So if the French want to sell stuff to the United States, it's going to be mostly denominated in the U.S. dollar because the U.S. is one end of the exchange. But if the French want to sell stuff to Argentina, you're dealing with two non-U.S. dollars, and the variety, the shift in that market gets crazy. So, for example, if the French want to sell a bunch of stuff to Argentina, they don't get paid in euro because nobody in Argentina has or wants euro. And they don't get paid in Argentine pesos because God knows nobody in France has or wants Argentine pesos. So what happens the Argentines buy the stuff, but they buy it in U.S. dollars. They convert their own currencies to dollars, and then the dollars are reconverted to euros to pay the French. The U.S. dollar there in the middle is the natural outcome of a mono-single currency system. Now, traditionally, since World War II, this is how everything has gone. Before World War II, the British pound was that intermediary. And since World War II, the United States has not overly manipulated markets to take advantage of that for any purposes. But since the United States no longer cares about the global order, the U.S. has started tinkering with it. So under President Obama, the security team put together a series of sanctions-related activities to counter what the Iranians were doing or to force them to the table. And he went in with scalpel-like precision to cut out individual transactions by entities and companies that the Obama administration did not have the smell of. And this basically took specific companies that had been dealing with Iran and forced them to cease operations. And eventually the Iranians caved and came talking to the Washington in order to strike a deal. And that's how it all got going. What the Trump administration has basically said is that scalpels are for wusses. And we're going to use a flamethrower instead. And we are going to threaten your entire country's access to that intermediate step, which means that the new sanctions regime doesn't just 
threaten your access to the U.S. market. It threatens your access to all markets. Because if you do not have access to the U.S. dollar as that middle step, all of a sudden you have to have sufficient liquidity in your country for every country that you want to trade with, which means that the currency risk is doubled or you consider what the United States might do to the other side. So and say they want to build this alternative method that uses the euro to do kind of a pseudo barter trade with Iran. A lot of countries have signed on. They're like, yeah, stick it to the U.S. Don't use the U.S. dollar. But not a single company anywhere in the world, even in Iran, has signed up to use this method because they all know that without the dollar, without access, there's nothing. How did they succeed in implementing that, as you said, with the Iranian sanctions under the Obama administration? Now, as you said, with a flamethrower under the Trump administration, I mean, is this exercising some amount of authority over SWIFT and the SWIFT payment network, or how is this being conducted? SWIFT is definitely one of the mechanisms, and that's one of the reasons why the Europeans have attempted to come up with an alternative. But considering there is no alternative currency, you really can't make it work. Uh, but yes, SWIFT has been threatened. Individual banks have been, well, I should probably broaden that, not individual banks. Every single bank in the world has been threatened. Uh, and since the U.S. dollar is core to all international exchange and all cross-border exchange, with the exception of inter-euro trade denominated in euros, everybody has caved. Everybody. And given what you said earlier about the different currencies that you feel have a, a long-term trajectory of viability here, U.S. dollar being one of them, Canadian dollar, uh, Aussie dollar, you named, a, I think, five different ones there. It doesn't sound like you believe, again, that there is going to be a replacement to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency. No, not, not within our lifetimes. We would need a significant change in geopolitical circumstances. Uh, keep in mind that the United States had been the world's largest economy going back to Reconstruction. So right after the Civil War, we were the largest economy in the world. But it still took from 1870 to the end of World War II for the United States to ultimately displace the British pound as the global currency. So not only would you need to have an economy out there that is larger than the United States, it would need a century track record, and it would need to be able to displace the United States as the global naval superpower. And even in those circumstances, not only do you have to be the largest economy in the world by a significant margin and have a century track record, you also have to be the global guarantor of security. Uh, the primary reason that the British pound was so powerful for so long wasn't just that the Brits were at the hub of global trade, but their security system, the global navy, allowed them to be the arbiter of global trade, even trade that didn't touch them. Now, the United States has provided that for everybody for free since 1945. Uh, that's probably the single second largest reason why the United States has controlled the global currency. And there's nothing on either of those fronts, size of economy, size of its naval force, that is any danger of being overwhelmed by any country or any coalition of countries within the next 50 years. So you've got to imagine a fundamentally different world if you want to imagine a world where the U.S. dollar does not reign supreme. Well, do you have any thoughts on a cryptocurrency alternative? That's something that's obviously been heralded as... No. <laughs> no chance? <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Cri cri no, no chance at all. Cryptocurrency has its uses here and there. If you want to smuggle money, particularly if you're into uh, sex trafficking or drug trafficking, it's, it's a great way to get around governments. Uh, but it's not an investment product. Uh, it's in the process of being cracked down by really every central government that matters because it is used almost exclusively for this sort of smuggling activity. Leaving aside the specific weaknesses of Bitcoin and just talking about cyber currencies writ large, what makes a currency work is having a monetary authority that can regulate its volume, its value, and its use. And there's nothing about any of the cryptocurrencies that have that. So it is a purely user-based phenomenon, and that means it will always be heavily used by people who, how should I say, have less than fully moral justifications for what they're doing. Uh, and so it's a fringe product. Now, the blockchain behind it, that's a whole different topic. There's a bright future for blockchain. You can figure out how to make money off of a specific technology that's software-based. You're a better man than I am. But cryptocurrency, no. Okay. Well, going back to your book, again, coming out in March 3rd, 2020, Disunited Nations, The Scramble for Power in an Ungoverned World. Where does the U.S.-China 
trade war, trade talks. Obviously, we just thought phase one agreement that was passed. The markets have been exploding in response, if you want to say that that was the cause. But how does this relate the U.S.-China trade war? How does this relate to disunited nations? Uh, the U.S.-China trade war is, it was inevitable. Uh, regardless of whether the United States wanted to engage from the world or disengage with the world, there had to be a reckoning with the Chinese. Uh, there is no way the Chinese system can survive without American participation. All the U.S. has to do if it wants to destroy, destroy China is go home. And in that sort of environment, we always knew that the talks were going to end in one of two ways. Option one, the Chinese were going to capitulate on everything that we cared about, and that was going to be the end. And they would have taken up that kind of British role as a subsidiary power under the American umbrella, and that would have been it. Or option two, they were not going to cave, in which case this is the beginning of the end of the Chinese system. Now, the demands that the Trump administration and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer have been making of the Chinese first and foremost is an end to this social financing model where everything gets bottomless subsidization. Without that model, the Chinese lose the capacity to maintain economic growth rates in order to maintain mass employment, which means that the entire political bedrock of the Chinese Communist Party would shatter. So from day one, as soon as we saw what the real demands of the, out of the Americans were, we knew that the Chinese were never going to agree to this in a way that it would actually be implemented. And so the trade talks have followed a very basic pattern. Americans make demands that the Chinese can't meet. The Chinese agree to meet them. Six weeks later, it becomes clear by the Chinese actions that they had no intention of meeting them. The Americans levy new tariffs. This is the pattern. This is how it will end. The phase one deal was nothing more than a bribe from the Chinese government to the United States to defer the next round of tariffs until the new year. And so by the time we get to February, probably, we'll be right back where we were a month ago. So expect more volatility around the trade talks then, it sounds like. Yeah, there's no version of this that ends well for the Chinese. If the Americans stay, the trade relationship has to be forcibly reworked. If the Americans leave, there is no trade relationship. So there, there's no way that this ends in a way that is a net increase in China's position. But there's a lot of ways where it ends with China's collapse. One last question. I want to try to get this in before we go. Obviously, we're coming up 2020, November 2020 is going to be the next presidential election. What are your thoughts on who's going to win and the race so far? Americans are fickle, so it's a little. I'm a little hesitant to make a firm prediction, um, but just knowing what we know now, it looks like the impeachment process isn't going to go anywhere conclusive. There's been nothing that has come out in the testimony and the evidence in the House that was a surprise to anyone, which means that it's really hard for me to see 20 Republican senators switching sides. So impeachment obviously has happened in the House, but conviction is not going to happen in the Senate, and Trump will not be removed from office. If you look at what's going on in the broader system, both the American, Democratic, and Republican coalitions have shattered, and it will take them five to 10 years to figure out how everything fits together again. This isn't odd. This isn't abnormal. This happens in American politics every generation or two. Now, the last time it went down, it was the Great Depression in World War II. And back then, the protectionists and big business and the low-tax, low-regulation folks, they were all Democrats. And African-Americans were all Republicans. So the factions move around. And one of the big things we've seen in just the last six months is that the unions have unofficially become a part of the Trump coalition. The NAFTA ratification that happened just a couple weeks ago only happened because the union movement basically jumped ship, abandoned the Democrats and sided with Trump. And to have unions in favor of a trade policy gives you an idea of how much things are in motion right now. Now, on the flip side, it's not like they are joining the coalition that we think of as Republican, because Trump has forcibly ejected the fiscal, business, and national security conservatives from the Republican Party. They are now complete free agents. So all this stuff is moving around. And in an environment where neither the Republicans or the Democrats are fully unified parties, it is up to individual personalities who can drive their own election campaigns uh, to set the agenda. And there is no individual in the United States who is more capable of doing that right now than the incumbent, Donald Trump. Not only can he lead the media around by the nose in a way that I have never seen out of any elected leader in any free country, uh, he is the incumbent and has all the advantages that come from that. If you look at the people who are running against him, 
Bernie Sanders is a flash in the pan. Elizabeth Warren has shown us with her health care plan that she's not as good as math as we all had thought. Camilla Harris has dropped out. Pete Buttigieg is a small town mayor who's probably going to flame out in the not too distant future. And really the only other one that is in the contention is Biden. And it seems like because the Democratic Party is in breakdown, that the remaining Democrats, particularly in the hard left, are doing everything they can to sabotage him. So unless something significant changes, uh, this is Trump's race to lose. As we've been saying on our show, I mean, if you don't see an economic recession, I believe it's two years prior to re-election, that definitely favors the incumbent. Overwhelming odds. So I would agree that it looks like things are definitely lining up for Trump without something major happening. Absolutely. Well, Peter, it was a pleasure having you on our show. Uh, what are some of the different ways that our listeners can follow your work? I know you have a newsletter, you're on Twitter. If you wouldn't mind, give out some of those different means. Sure. If you go to my website, which is zeihan.com, you can sign up for the free newsletter. It comes out whenever something interesting happens in the world and I have time to write about it usually about every week or two. The new book, Disunited Nations, is available for pre-order on pretty much every platform you can imagine right now. And I'll be doing the tour for that in the not-too-distant future. Well, Peter, it was a pleasure having you on our show, giving us an update on your latest book. I definitely want to endorse it and recommend all of our listeners to go out and pre-order a copy. We look forward to having you on the show again, and I wish you a happy new year and uh, all the best to you as we come into 2020. Fantastic. Until next time. So once again, that was Peter Zion. He is a premier geopolitical strategist, one of the smartest and forward-thinking guys out there. I can't speak highly enough of him. He worked for the State Department. Previously, he was at Stratford developing a lot of the different analytical models that they use. He has also been a consultant for a wide number of think tanks. And although I didn't read his second book, The Absent Superpower, his first one, which we spoke with him on our show about, The Accidental Superpower, The Next Generation of American Preeminence and the Coming Global Disorder, was fascinating, especially when he talked about just the sheer number of resources and wealth that the U.S. has when you think about geography, natural resources, and a whole host of other things that come together to creating U.S. being the global superpower and why it is likely to remain as a global superpower regardless of which fools are elected to office in the years ahead or in the past because all of these things come together in such a unique way to set up the U.S. for success for a long time coming. So he has some really fascinating data that he goes through example after example after example. So if you're not familiar with this work, I would definitely recommend The Accidental Superpower. You can look him up online, watch plenty of different videos, presentations he's given on this as well. Lots of material to go through, of course. And as you heard from this interview, I mean, Peter is making some very, very bold and big claims in his newest book, talking about China perhaps not being a unified nation in the years ahead, something that could crack quite soon. He gave some reasons for that in this interview. So that would be a very big event, of course. One of the things that we discuss is the fact that, again, China is now the most overcredited country in human history in absolute and relative terms. There's a chart that he has presented which looks at how China compares to every other nation across the world in terms of the amount of credit that is held there and why, if you were to compare the U.S. during the peak of the housing bubble with the amount of credit that was circulating in our system then and how over leveraged we were, the U.S. pales in comparison to China. So a very interesting things that he brings up. And again, he'll be discussing this in Disunited Nations. I also think it's fascinating how he believes that the U.S. dollar has a very long term upward trend ahead of it. He didn't think it's going to go straight up. But over the long term, he does believe that the U.S. dollar is going to continue to increase, especially as we start to see a breakdown among other currencies in these other nations that he talked about that are not relatively self-sufficient in this breakdown of globalization that he foresees. And one thing that I would push back on that is how America will respond by devaluing its currency. So, that would be one element to that that could offset some of that upward rise in the U.S. dollar. If, as we've already seen, that the U.S. is continuing to run very large budget deficits and will spend as modern monetary theory takes hold, which it most likely will, then in that case, we could see a uh, pretty significant devaluation and printing of U.S. dollars 
to offset some of that upward climb. But in sum, if we were to encapsulate here a lot of Peter Zion's work, his first book, The Accidental Superpower, was about how America became a global superpower, largely due to its geography, its natural resources, the amount of waterways that go through agriculturally rich region, making it self-sufficient for food production and like, number of different things, deep water ports, etc., etc., the confluence of which do not exist anywhere else on the planet except with the United States. His second book was talking about how, with the Shell Revolution, this now means that in addition to natural natural resources and geography, we also now, the United States, has possession of very rich oil resources. And then that is also going to set us up for the long term and especially means that the United States is going to reorient itself away from becoming much more concerned about global stability to ensure the global order that was set up in the post-World War II economy to now have one focusing on itself. And that's exactly what we've seen now with the election of Donald Trump with the phrase, make America great again, even thinking about putting America's interests first, prioritizing America above all other international interests. So that was a big shift in thinking from Obama to Trump. And so Peter Zion argued in his second book that the U.S. would be removing itself from the global stage. And this is something that we see playing out in real time right now. The third book, Disunited Nations and the Scramble for Power in an Ungoverned World, builds on these first two, now talking about how the world is entering its greatest period of change in nearly a century, where the period of American hyper-involvement in global affairs is now ending. And so Peter looks at the impacts on global energy, agricultural markets, finance, technology, and of course, major countries. So as Peter said in this interview, there's going to be a large reshuffling in the current international power structure. Russia, India, China, and Brazil, Peter argues, will not be the superpowers of the future. Germany will decline as the most powerful country in Europe, with France taking its place. And as Peter discussed in this interview, Peter writes that every country should prepare for the collapse of China. Whether you agree or disagree with Peter Zion's forecast and some of his work, one thing that I have to say is that he has some of the most solid research and arguments to back his ideas. It is very hard to disagree with the arguments he makes because they are backed so solidly. So I am very much looking forward to reading his new book, Disunited Nations, when it comes out in March. When it does, expect us to break down a lot of the different arguments and forecasts that he's making for individual countries and for various sectors of the global economy, because if he's correct in his outlook, obviously the implications are huge. And as always, if any of you pick up the book, which I think it's going to be worthwhile, do send me your feedback on some of the topics that he raises. I think it would be really fun to see if there's any parts of what he's forecasting that you, our audience, do not think is going to happen and why. You know, if cryptocurrencies or blockchain-like technologies are going to replace the U.S. dollar or why China will in fact not collapse. So there's a lot of different things that we can get into, lots of areas that we can discuss that I know all of you are interested. So please feel free to send me your feedback to cris at financialsense.com. If there's anything that we raised in this interview that you'd like to send me your feedback on, please feel free to do so as well. And again, if you would like to follow Peter's work in the future, you can go to his website. It's zion.com. That's spelled Z-E-I-H-A-N.com. He has a newsletter. He sends out content about weekly. Much of it has been more recently oriented around his new book, giving previews of some of the things that he's going to discuss in it. So that would be a, a very good way to familiarize yourself with some of the arguments that he's making. You can follow him on Twitter at Peter Zion. And again, if you haven't read his past two books, I would definitely recommend the first one, The Accidental Superpower. That was a mind-blowing book. And I'm sure the second one, The Absent Superpower, is just as good as well. Highly rated on Amazon, The Accidental Superpower. Also very highly rated and got some major endorsements by some pretty high-profile individuals. So you won't be disappointed.